So in, in Matthew chapter 9, uh, what we see is, is Jesus is about to pick another disciple. And so far previously to Matthew chapter 9, we've seen Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Now this is important. All of these dudes were fishermen. So we've talked about this before, but to, to, to be a fisherman back then, if you're a fisherman, that's awesome. If your name's Gordon, even cooler. Uh, but back then, you know, to be a Jewish, sorry, <laughs> Gordon fisherman, uh, I am out of control, Kylie. What am I doing today? Uh, so, so back then, uh, to, uh, a Jewish person that, that was a fisherman basically meant that they, they went through Hebrew school and they, they weren't cut out for it that their rabbi basically said, okay, go ahead and ply your trade. Like, you're not good enough to follow, to be, to, to follow in the rabbi's teaching, to become one of my disciples. To, so go ahead and ply your trade. So it was basically them being rejected, and they would go and then kind of do whatever the family business was, the family trade. Again, that's how it was back then. I think it's important for us to know that because Jesus' first disciples were not culturally the brightest of the bright, like the most popular, the most eloquent, elegant, even good. Like they, they, they were people that kind of culturally, academically said, you don't have what, it's ta- what it takes, so go ahead and just do your trade. And so that's what Jesus, that's where he starts. He goes, I choose you. I want you. A little mini message. Jesus chooses us not because we deserve it, not because we're better, just not because he's like picking dodgeball and going like, you got, look like you got a good arm. No, all of us are proverbial spiritual fishermen, people that spiritually have been passed over. And I think all of us have had moments in our lives where we felt like we weren't a part of the cool club. We weren't picked first. We weren't the best. But that's okay because our God is perfect, and he wants to call you and use you for his purposes. So join the long list of disciples following him ever since Jesus pointed to some boats. Now, what we see next is very interesting because so far we've seen some fishermen. And what's about to happen is Jesus is about to approach Matthew, who was a tax collector. Now, this is very important because kind of culturally for the Jews— they hated tax collectors. They despised tax collectors. These were the kind of people that were, that were kind of culturally known as the people that kind of sold their own people out. That they had, they're working for the government, and so they were not only exploiting people, but they were taking extra money to earn their own salary. So tax collectors were hated. They were despised, especially fishermen. I was reading historically that, that the fishermen were some of the most exploited people with tax collectors because you couldn't hide your success from the government. That they could see literally as you pulled it out of your boat how much money you made that day. So they would know, oh, that's big haul. I'm making bank today. So again, this isn't explicitly in the Bible at all, but I know historically, culturally. So just hang here with me. Hypothetically, possibly, the disciples are seeing Jesus approach Matthew, the tax collector, and they're ready for some tables to flip again. They're really excited. They're like, whoa, oh, whoa, oh, oh, oh. do you see what's about? Like, they're ready. They're like, oh, they're like getting their cameras out. Like, it's going to be good, you know? Like, because they, they think that, like, okay, like, Jesus has been really mean to Pharisees so far, but now it's, it's, a, it's a tax collector. Like, on the Jewish hierarchy of hatred, you know, it was like Pharisee, then tax collector, then people that park at a gas pump, but then go inside and get food instead. We talk about that for just a moment? <laughs> Sorry, every now and then I got a little bit of therapy for me. Oh, I get so mad when people do that. You park behind them, all of a sudden, like, they're like, are they gonna, they like open up, and then all of a sudden they're just, <laughs> you're like, what? It like, feels like 30 minutes later they come back with like Cheetos, like a big gulp, you know, and then they drive away, they don't even get gas. I'm gonna be honest with you, okay? This doesn't leave the room, okay? If you do that to me while I'm parked behind you, I'm gonna set, I'm gonna set up just a tiny, tiny little prayer that your tires pop on your way out, okay? <laughs> A little tiny prayer. Like, keep them safe, but ruin their afternoon, Jesus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, tax collectors, you're like, it's like, what translation is he reading from? I don't, I don't recognize this. So again, so Jesus is approaching Matthew, the tax collector, with fishermen disciples behind him. I don't think it's much of a stretch that they're like, he's about to rebuke him. He's about to flip his tax collector booth table. This is going to be really good in a really bad way for Matthew. But let's go ahead and read it. It says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector booth. Maybe you know what happens. Just read the next verse with me. What does he say? Does he flip a table? No. He says, follow me and be my disciple. Imagine the fisherman disciples. Who's going to be hanging with us now? What? 
Like, I'm still trying to pay this guy back because I, I got some fish one day. And he's like, ooh, good for me. Like, what? Did, did Jesus misspeak? Did he make a mistake? Jesus, you want to try that again, man? I don't think you said the right words. He says, Matthew, follow me and be my disciple. Don't miss this. Jesus chooses the fishermen and the tax collector, two people groups, two ideologies, two vocations, totally opposed. Culturally, they hate each other. And Jesus smiles because he's building his kingdom and he doesn't draw lines where we want to draw lines. And again, I picture him just like, <laughs> like the God the Father's like, check this out, they're gonna hate this one. Matthew, tax collector, I choose you. I want you. Follow me and be my disciples. Be my disciple. So Matthew got up and he followed him. Don't miss this either. I love this. It's not just like, follow me. I'll see you on Sunday. Uh, Jesus hangs out with Matthew. He has dinner, which is which cultural. This was an intimate thing. This is like community group times 100, like refrigerator rights, which is an old joke. If you remember that, you're my people. You, you, you came through COVID because that's a pre-COVID joke. Like you have refrigerator rights and then some to invite someone into your home. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, among with many tax collectors. I love how the New, uh, New Living Translation says it. And disreputable sinners. And you know what's coming if you've been a part of this series so far. Here comes the, the trombone slides of a human being. Burr, 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 burr. Here comes the Pharisees. And so when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, man, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Why does your teacher hang out with such horrible, sinful, disgusting human beings? New, new bucket list item for every single one of us in this room to go hang out with, quote unquote, scum. Amen. People that the religious, bigoted jerks don't want you spending time with. How did, like, they really think, again, that Jesus is doing the wrong thing. How dare Jesus hang out with a tax collector? With, he's eating with them. He's spending time with them. And Matthew brought more of his bros from the tax collector booth to hang out with Jesus. So you know what Jesus is going to do. He's going to do what Jesus does. It says this. And Jesus heard this. He said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Now, I, I wanna, he, he's about to explain this, but just in case, because I know sometimes you, you guys are on your phones, you don't listen. He's not calling the Pharisees healthy and them sick. You'll hear it, you'll hear it here. What, actually, he's kind of leaning in and saying, these people are getting healthy because they're in my presence. You're the sickest ones of all. He's going, healthy people don't need a doctor. We say, people that, that, that think they're perfect don't feel like they need me. So yeah, I'm gonna go spend time with the sick because that's what I came here to do. Again, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, love this, go and learn what this means. Go learn the meaning of this scripture. To me, like, Jesus being like, little, little, little peeved and dismissive. Like, you guys who say you've mastered the Bible and memorized it, like, memorized the whole Torah, go learn what this means. Which, which, in, which in a way, is a messianic prophecy about himself. He says, go learn what this means, Pharisees who think you're perfect. I want you to show mercy not offer sacrifices. What is he really saying to them? He's saying that you cannot earn this by yourself. You can't sacrifice and white knuckle religion your way into my kingdom. What you need is my mercy. You think you're, they're scum? Everyone needs me. There's no hierarchy of good and bad and deserving and undeserving people in the kingdom of God. It's all of us don't deserve it. He came down and gave us grace and mercy. He's saying, I don't want sacrifices. I don't need your sacrifice. He, Jesus died and rose again for us. He's not like, oh man, thanks for all your effort. He did it for us. So he's saying, listen, go, go learn what this means. Pastor, basically what he's saying to the Pharisees. Go with the teachers of the law. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And I love this. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. So what I, what I want to do next is kind of explain my theme. And it's, I know it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit, tongue-in-cheek, and I hope not at all offensive, but I think it's the shortest way to explain what I think Jesus is explaining to us here. 
Because again, culturally, they were like, go get them, Jesus. Tax collectors are coming. And then Jesus shows him mercy. And then even the Pharisees were like, whoa, he's hanging out. He's not supposed to show mercy and grace to those kind of people. And Jesus goes, no, no, I came here for the sick, not the healthy. Go and learn what this means. I give everyone mercy. So I know this is a little tongue-in-cheek, but I think it's the fastest way to explain what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about gracism (laughs) this morning. And we all know racism. Horrible, don't worry, I'll hit it during the message. If racism is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism based on someone's race or ethnic group, then I think what, what the Pharisees were doing is what I, I just want to call, and I know it's a little silly, gracism, which is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism based on someone's sin, based on someone's failure, or based on someone's past. And oh, I hope God works in us, lest we literally do the opposite of this message and go, yeah, this is a really good message for them. But I'm good. I'm perfect. I don't have any prejudices. I think we've all been guilty of people that, God, we want mercy and grace and forgiveness and love, joy, peace, patience. Give it all to me. But that person hurt me. That person wronged me. I want revenge on them. Or I'm good. I'm a Christian. But they're a different kind of Christian. So I don't think they're a Christian because they're a different kind of Christian. So how about you throw down some fireballs in their general direction today? Again, I I think what Jesus gets very angry at is the idea that we get Jesus all to ourselves. And he's not allowed to work and he's not allowed to forgive and he's not allowed to move in someone that maybe, okay, yeah, let's let's put all our cards on the table. Has wronged you? Has hurt you? has, Has maybe like, really mess things up for you, but it's so easy for us to draw a line in the sand and assume Jesus is only in our camp, only in our church, only in our family, only in our lives. And I hope all of us, just those blinders are removed away and we would never be a gracist of thinking God cannot work in them. I really just want God to judge them and hurt them and harm them, but that's not how Jesus works. Even he puts the fishermen and the tax collector together. So I've already been silly with it. So that's the title of my sermon. Don't be a gracist. Welcome to Legacy Church. Again, what we're talking about today is I think when bitterness, when unforgiveness in our own hearts can get in the way of God's love. Where I want to take you now is Luke chapter 18. Uh, And and this is what I, 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 when I read this, I laugh. Because it's so interesting, just like a few weeks ago when we were, we were uh, reading the, the, the rebuke, the, the, I think it was the seven woes that Jesus shares, the woe to you, Pharisees and teachers of the law. His words were so biting. They were so blunt. And I just, it was, it was, and it was also very creative and poetic. Like you whitewashed tombs, you snakes, you brood of vipers. Like you go across land and sea just to make a single convert, then bring them back and make them twice the son of hell. That's just Jesus. That's this red letter gospel. I'm like, man, Jesus. Again, that's what made Jesus mad. And so here, I see Jesus' humor. I see his sarcasm. And I think this is really funny. I I think everyone, when when they heard this, they would have been like, man, that Jesus guy's hilarious. Like, the Messiah, like, he's got some bits. Like, it's really, I think they would, like, literally, like, like Jim Gaffigan's Hot Pocket or John Mulaney's Salt and Pepper Diner. If you don't know what those are, Google them after this sermon. Like, they'd be like, have you heard the guys, like, if you heard the thing about, that Jesus says about the Pharisee and the tax collector, it's really funny. And so listen, he, again, this is a bit of a parable. He, he tells a story, again, to, to talk about this idea. I, I know, we'll just laugh together through the sermon. This idea of gracism, of like, you don't deserve his love. I deserve it. I'm better, but you're wrong. You're the bad guy. I'm the good guy. And what we talked about was really the heart of the Pharisee, but may that never be the case in this church. So, so hear this with me. I, I love it. It says, then Jesus told this story. I think it's very interesting. It's really cool that Luke explains the purpose of this parable right here. Then Jesus told them a story to some who had what? So what is the purpose of this little joke bit parable that Jesus is going to do? This is to rebuke people who had confidence in their own righteousness 
and scorned everyone else. You hear it, right? So they think they're great, they think they're amazing, and then they judge everyone else. They don't want anyone else to have mercy. They don't want anyone else to be forgiven. They don't want anyone to grow. Like they're so, they love their self-righteousness and they love looking down on people that when people actually get delivered, when they actually get healed, when they actually encounter Jesus and start working on progressive sanctification, they don't like that. Because like Kirkley, it's slow battle acts, everything's a competition to them. <laughs> Just again. I'm sorry, Kirkley. <laughs> you should have seen him. We were having fun. I know where he's like, okay, best of 10. And then he was like, oh, wait, you got to call your shots. If you don't call your shots, you don't get no points. I'm like, all right, bro. <laughs> he really wanted a good story to share on Sunday. <laughs> he did really good. I love you, Kirkley, so much. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and read this before I get myself in more trouble. It says this. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. So here it is. Two guys walk into a bar. No, there's actually two guys walking into a temple. Watch this. Two men went to the temple and pr- and to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a tax collector. I missed a word. Excuse me. A despised tax collector. Now just picture this. Have some moment. Picture this in your mind. You're in the middle of a Jewish temple. I've never been to one. If you've been to one, picture it in your mind. I know this isn't the case, but in my mind, I picture like an old school, like Catholic cathedral with an organ playing in the bath- bathroom. My goodness, what is up with me today? I'm trying to decaffeinate, I promise. That's what's going on. I'm trying to drink less coffee. I clearly need more. <laughs> so he listened to the organ with me. He says, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. So then in the middle of the synagogue, in the middle of the temple, I just hear a rickety church bench and all of a sudden, the Pharisee's got a prayer, and he's going to say it standing up in front of everyone. So picture it, just all of a sudden, next to Mike, Pharisee stands up. And this is his beautiful, wonderful, elegant prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. I'm not a cheater, right? Cheaters and sinners and adulterers. And then he points someone out. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. Tax collector's like, well, me? Could you imagine? I love this. It says, I fast twice a week. Now, Jewish, tra- the law of the tradition was that you're only supposed to fast once a year. But this guy, again, he's like, oh, you guys are junior varsity. I play for the big leagues for Jesus, or for Jesus, for, for, for Yahweh. <laughs> I'm going to fast twice a week. And I give you a tenth of all of my income. Now, I picture Jesus giving this guy a British accent. I know they wouldn't have known what a British accent was back then, but that's what I hear. And I I can't do a British accent or else you know I'd bring it out right now. But I just, can you just do like, like the guy stands up. And I think we've all, maybe maybe we've, we've encountered people like this before in our past, but again, that would be a sermon for them. I hope all of us can just ask God to chip away at all of our pride. Because what Jesus basically does is somebody stands up and says, God, I, I just want to sing a new song to you today that I am perfect and I thank you for my perfection, right? He says, like, uh, I, I, you're welcome. Jesus, I just want to, could you imagine singing that in a worship song? We sing, you're welcome, Lord, for being here. You know, like, that's what he does. Like, I'm the best, you are good too. I don't know, okay, enough improv. You know, like, he just, like, I, I just, I know. I know that you're really excited, you're really pumped that I'm here today. So I just want to give my shout of praise to myself for being here today. I ain't no cheat. I ain't no sinner. Like, God, you know that. I'm keeping score, but I know you're keeping score too because you're Santa Claus, apparently. Checking a list, making it twice. Said that backwards. Don't worry, this sermon's got to end soon because I'm really messing up today. And then he points someone out. I'm certainly no tax collector. And again, we can all add that list. Those people groups, I don't want to name them because I'll start getting despised, but you know, be it from political preference, ideology or identity or gender, right? I'm nothing like them, those people. I don't send my kids to public school like some weirdo. I actually care about my kids. Homeschooling, butter churning, homegrown Christians, you know, like, you know, so, and that's what he does. His prayer is all about himself and the things that he's doing for God. And he's looking around. He's like, you and I both know everyone here sucks. But I'm amazing. I'm perfect. I'm wonderful. Again, I know I'm having fun. But that's the joke that Jesus makes. He's being hyperbolic. He's being fun. He's imagining, like, just imagine if somebody stood up in church, started pointing people out, like calling everyone out, like, you're nothing like me, son. So then, 
Next verse, it says this, but the tax collector, again, I love it. He has some fun with the Pharisee. He's kind of being hyperbolic. And then again, I think he shows us the true heart of repentance. So again, now let's picture this tax collector. Again, it says the Pharisee stood up in front of everyone. What does a tax collector do? He stood at a distance. He dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow. He said, oh God, have mercy on me. Be merciful to me. For I am a sinner. That's it. Hear how long the Pharisee's list was? Hear how loud, hear how contrite and repentant and humble the tax collector is? Again, who's also despised. He says, God, be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner, and that's it. And I love this, and you, I don't think Jesus has to explain it to us. He probably clearly had to explain it to them, but I'm happy that he does anyway. He says, I tell you, it was the tax collector, it was the sinner, not the Pharisee. He's the one that returned home justified before God. And he gives us this promise, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I love that. He's like, you think you're so cool. You think you're so... And, and this is convicting to me because I'm just picturing us, and it's so easy in our, in our sinful humanity to idealize, if not deify sinfully, the people that are loud, the people that are on stage, I talk about it enough, my own junk, I'm just a dude, I have the job, I still don't know how I have the job, we're all just following Jesus together, you know? I would say even to be a pastor, it takes a particular, like a, uh, I'm a particularly weird person, and it's something I, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I gotta tell that to you, I don't know, <laughs> what are you talking about? It's a weird thing to be like, hey, listen to me for 30 to 40 minutes, like it's weird, it's something I always gotta, gotta, gotta deal with, but I, we try as often, like, it's all about Jesus here, but it's so easy for us to think the people that are vocal, or the people that are more expressive during worship, or the people that have gifts and talents, to be like, wow, they're extra super anointed. Like, like they, got, they got that super Jesus, you know, but I, I just got the normal Diet Coke Jesus, like, let's just say, you know? And, and I love this because like, and if we just picture this, picture this like someone standing up in the congregation, everyone's like, whoa. And then there's just this, this like guy in the back who's just like, God, I just, I need your help. I just feel so broken. I just need your help. And that's it. And Jesus is saying, I'm close to that guy. That's the guy I'm working on. That's the guy that has my presence. That's the guy that has my power. Pay no attention to all the pomp and circumstance, right? That guy. He's like, that's the guy that left justified. That's the guy that left with my spirit. That's the guy. And then again, he gives us this promise for those who exalt themselves will be humbled. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, I, I want to I I take you somewhere fun because, again, this is, this is a parable, but this is all kind of hypothetical for their eyes. And this, this actually, uh, this happened the very next chapter. So this is very quickly after. Obviously, Jesus knew it was coming. But let me just quickly uh, share with you one of my all-time favorite stories in the Bible. It's Luke chapter 19. If you just want to go to the next page, scroll up to the next chapter. Luke chapter 19. This is the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. Now, if you grew up in church, all you know is Zacchaeus was a we little man and we little manna was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Right arm. Just kidding. That's a different song. Okay. I love this. I love this because uh, when I went with Carl to his healing hands, we did a bunch of schools, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, did like 20. And, and it, they were so quick. It was just like, I'm just going to do the story of Zacchaeus. And it was so fun because in, in, you know, in Spanish, it's not Zacchaeus, it, it's, which they also don't like the name Garrett. They thought that was the widest thing they'd ever heard. They'd be like, you know, como te llamas? Like, Garrett. And they all go, <laughs> Garrett. Like they just thought it was the silliest thing. It's true. So true. But we don't say Zacchaeus, they said Zacchaeo, which was, it was just so much cooler. You know, like Z Zacchaeo. And at the schools where they had like jungle gyms and stuff, when, he, when, when Zacchaeo climbed the sycamore tree, like I would climb up stuff. It was so much fun. My poor translator was like, where are you going, bro? But it just, I, had, I had, had a blast. So I love the story. I'm not going to do it justice, but I just want to read this quickly because literally Jesus gives a hypothetical. He, he tells a parable about the Pharisee and, and this tax collector. And then literally he saves a tax collector and the people still don't get it. So just read this quickly with me, because I just love this story. It says, when Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, 
a man was there by the name of Zaccheo, the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. So again, this is a man who has exploited and taken advantage of every single person in this community to the point where he's not just doing okay, he's a cheat, like he's climbed the corporate ladder of being a tax collector. He's probably burned bridges with other tax collectors, straight up mafia style. Actually, when I picture Zacchaeus, I always picture Yoda in a pinstripe suit, because that's how my brain works, because he was a short, wee little man, and he probably was dressed very nice. And so again, this man is despised because he has hurt everyone around. And I love this. It says, he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Let me just rant for a moment, because I I love this. What is Zacchaeus' reasoning for going to meet Jesus? We don't read, I really want to repent of my greed. I I, I really want to, don't don't hear me wrong, that happens, but I love this. He literally goes like, okay, I'll check it out. I just, small little mini sermon, relational evangelism is so powerful, and you don't know what seeds you're planting. You don't know what's going on as you're loving people, as you're serving them, as you're inviting them to church. You don't know. Because Zacchaeus, his motives was not, I'm coming forward, it's altar call. He didn't hear the pipe organs. No, he just went, I heard, maybe, again, possibly he went, this Jesus guy's getting pretty popular. I better get to know him because I'm the chief tax collector and it's all about who you know. So he goes to just check him out and then he climbs up a tree to probably not be seen, but he wants to see Jesus. And then I love it. It says, when Jesus reached the spot, I always loved, I always had fun with that in Peru. When Jesus reached the spot, I just picked like, this is a divine appointment. Zacchaeus thinks he's being all sneaky climbing up in the tree, but Jesus like, he goes, and bam, Zacchaeus. Like he knows, like he knows. Can you imagine how terrified Zacchaeus was? Like he's up in a tree and Jesus is like, what up, bro? And he's like, ah, I'm freaking out. So when, when Jesus reached the spot, the moment, the divine appointment in eternity passed, Jesus said, today I'm saving Zacchaeus. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down. You imagine, like, what? We talked a few weeks ago about how we all get, like, little OCD. Remember, you might be a Pharisee, that, the, the super Jeff Foxworthy day, uh, where we talked about how you want to incessantly clean your house when, if anyone ever shows up. Remember? Do you remember that from a few weeks ago, right? Can you imagine Jesus being like, see you tonight? And you had no plan. Like, you had no idea, like, deep cleaning everything. So he says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once. And what happens? Man, when you you encounter Jesus, everything melts away. It says he greeted him and welcomed him gladly. And don't miss this. This is is really why I want to tell you this story. It says that all the people saw this and then began to mutter, he's going to be the guest of a sinner. They begin to grumble, complain, to gossip. Did you see what just happened? Like, Jesus was walking by. Like, I have my Torah ready. I wanted Jesus to sign my Torah. Then he points up to the tree, and he's hanging out with Zacchaeus. That's not okay. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not. The tax, co- like, the worst dude in town, Jesus gets to hang, like, G- like, Zacchaeus gets to invite the Messiah over. This isn't fair. This isn't right. Somebody's got to do something about this. I'll post on Facebook about this. I'll go down to my local senator. I don't know, the local chief, chief tax collector. Talk about them. They're not okay with this. And since I've already been silly enough, I give you this for free. You know, I get to study the Bible throughout the week, and sometimes you learn things that are just so much fun, you got to share it on a Sunday. So that word mutter, mutter, which means to grumble, to complain, to gossip. Uh, the Greek word for mutter is diagonizo, which is the same Greek word or it comes from the same Greek root as diarrhea. (laughs) Love it so much. So just, let me just lean into it. So when you gossip and complain and speak judgmentally about someone else, and you're like, did you hear what happened? Did you hear? hear, I heard their marriage isn't doing too good. I heard he's back drinking again. Like all of that, like the Lord just hears... It's technically biblical. (laughs) 
I would love, I challenge you today, next time someone starts gossiping in front of you, just, just give it to them like right in the face. They started grumbling. They started complaining. They started, dia, dia, I have it here. <laughs> Literally the first word, it's right there. First phrase, yeah. They started muttering. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. How dare Jesus? Man, God, may we never be like that. And I love this. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now. I love this. In the middle of dinner, like Zacchaeus can't take it anymore. I just picture him like he puts his plate down. He stands up like, like Jesus, I, I just, I just, I can't, I can't. Here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay them back four times the amount. I, I, I love this. You know, okay, I'll go, go worship team, I, I, I'm wrapping up. You can, you can come on back. And I know, Daniel, you need this for the loop, so I'm wrapping up. Don't miss this. God created Zacchaeus to be a generous person. That is who he is in him. Over the longest time, Zacchaeus believed the lie that his identity was in money and wealth and greed and exploitation. It's clear that when he encounters Jesus Christ, a whole new identity, more than anything, more than, you, more than your job, more than your sex, more than your gender, more than anything, more, more, more than what you think you bring to the table. Your identity in Christ is what is most important. And then Zacchaeus, you see the crazy flip? Like he almost goes too far the other way. He's like, I'll pay him back four times. If I get you, Jesus, nothing else matters. He gets so excited. And so what does Jesus say? He goes, no, you're a tax collector. Get out of here. No. No, even for Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man, I love this, because this man is the son of Abraham. He's not saying, oh, because you're family line. No, he's saying, you're part of my family. You're part, I'm adopting you, Zacchaeus, into the kingdom of God. You're so important to me, Zacchaeus, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Let me just, I, I just feel obedient to say, to say something, um, and then I, I, got a, I got a quick story to share as we close out. Um, as you guys know, you, I've talked about it a lot, like especially over the last few years, I, I've really had to deal with bitterness and unforgiveness in my own life. Just with everything, all the chaos, all the political nonsense, all of the, just the, the lines in the sand that COVID and people getting so upset about things that they really, I think, like, the, the, like it's, it's our bread and butter as a church to stand against this, to stand against the marginalized, to stand against the hurt, to stand and love people just like Jesus, but then people being upset with you because of that. People somehow thinking, like, you're doing the work of Satan because you're trying to love people. Like, it, just, it, just, it just still doesn't make sense to me, but I've had bitterness I've had to walk through. So I'm saying that not to be like, oh, well, he's, he's not. I'm saying like, it's something I really need to work. So, so thinking about this transition with Zacchaeus has really ministered to me, um, both because we're all Zacchaeus, make no mistake, we're all Zacchaeus. We find our identity, we find our purpose, we find our joy, we find our, our excellence, we think the, the reason why we think we're better than other people and not our identity in, our identity in Christ. But it was something my, my wife Kristen helped me with because I don't know if you, you do this. And, and, and honestly, it's reminding me of how, how you worded, oh, you, you, we talk about, Josh, you talk about love keeps no record of wrongs. And, but you added, you added a, a word that was so just ugh, in the best way possible. You said, love keeps no record of being wronged. I don't know why. I mean, obviously that's what it meant, but it was like, oh, man, because it's so easy for me to just keep my little list, you know, my little burn book of all the people that have wronged me and hold those, and often, with, with, which is not fair to, to Chris and my wife, but I'll, I'll just tell the stories again when I'm just feeling particularly jerkish and self-righteous. And I'll be like, hey, remember, remember that one time that one thing happened, and then you know, that one person? Because, I, I again, I, I want to relive that memory in my mind because, again, I've warped it in a way where I am the hero of every story, right? And they're just the most evil, demonic people ever, which really is, no, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And I forget, I forget what she said, but she was like, yeah, 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 I remember that eight years ago. <laughs> Something like that. And I, and I realized, I realized, I had to, I had to say, yeah. <laughs> if you didn't hear it, that's okay. <laughs> A little bit of muttering over there in that general direction. <laughs> exactly. So I said, you know what? This, was what? this is what was helpful for me. 
I'm mad at a person that doesn't even exist anymore. This thing happened eight years ago, nine years ago. Some things in my own, 20 years ago. And I, because I, I, don't, I don't want to forgive, because I'm a bit of a gracist, because I don't want them to grow. I don't want them. I don't want Jesus to work in their life. I want them to stay that person that hurt me, and that's it. I want to dehumanize them to only be the thing that they did, only the thing that they said, taking no account into what I did to cause the situation. And again, again, the big thing, or the fact that possibly, in big quotation marks, hypothetically, again, big quotation marks, Jesus has been working on them for eight years as well. That Jesus has been working on them. Imagine, do you remember yourself a few years ago? You're like, yeah, I was happy. We didn't know what COVID was. I still, you know, right? No, just, I mean, hopefully, right? Hopefully you can look at yourself months ago, years ago, and be like, man, I'm, like, I'm not perfect now, but I've really grown spiritually, emotionally. I'm healthier now than I, than I was then. So what if, what if those people that aren't really a part of our life anymore, but we still hold grudges against, those people that we just, we, we just refuse to forgive, what if we at least gave them that benefit of the doubt? The thing that happened that was a situation that was an instant in time, maybe, maybe I just met pre-Jesus Zacchaeus. Maybe I just caught a little bit of their old identity. And again, let alone maybe they were just having a bad day and they just said things that they shouldn't have said. Maybe they just, they, 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 they gossiped about me and they know that was wrong, but I can forgive them. Because again, Jesus gives us so much grace. So what I want to what I want to do is uh, I want to I want to end with it here. I'll, I'll give this to you. I have a lot of notes for this little story, but I'm just going to believe in the name of Jesus. I'll remember it. <laughs> um, we're going to end with a worship song, but I I want to share with you um, what I think is one of the most powerful stories. I just I just read this week. Maybe you've heard this before, uh, but this is a story of of Daryl Davis, and I think we we have his picture up here. Um, if you're not familiar with Daryl Davis, uh, he's a very accomplished blues and, quote, boogie-woogie piano player. Uh, very, very good. Um, but he's not as well-known for that. He's well-known about what happened to him when he was 10 years old and how that changed everything about him. Now, you can, sorry, you can play that loop. That's, that's totally fine. I, I, I love the sound of it. Um, so... Daryl Davis, his dad worked for kind of foreign affairs for the U.S. government, so he traveled all over the world as a kid, traveled all over multiple countries. And then when his dad um, came back, they, they moved back to kind of their hometown in Massachusetts, kind of in the early 60s. And again, Daryl, he'd been all around the world. He's never encountered racism before. And so what happened is he joined the Cub Scouts as a 10-year-old, but kind of in his town, that Cub Scouts was known as in whites-only Cub Scouts. You're not allowed to have a black person in the Cub Scouts. So what happened horribly in Daryl's life as a 10-year-old is he was in his troop going down a little kind of local parade in town. The people at the parade threw bottles and rocks at Daryl as a 10-year-old. And he literally had never experienced it before. He had to go home to his dad. He literally didn't like, what, what, what happened? What did, I, what did I do? And his dad had to sit him down and explain to him. Again, it was the 60s, Massachusetts, just like this, this is... People don't like us because of the color of our skin. And that horrific event started this kind of, what we talked about kind of week one of this series, this kind of holy dissatisfaction in Daryl's life. He's like, I just don't, I don't understand why someone would hate me and they don't even know me. That's so cool. I, I, I could tell you more of the story, but, but Daryl, a, a believer in Jesus, his love of God caused him to do something quite crazy. Um, there was one night, I think he was 20, 23 at the time, and he was, he was playing piano, again, boogie-woogie piano, uh, at, at a bar that was kind of locally known as kind of, this is, this is a whites-only bar. And he played so well that afterwards there was a white gentleman uh, that told him, this is the first time I've ever heard a black man play better than Jerry Lee Lewis. Jerry Lee Lewis, a famous white pianist. And Daryl laughed and said, Jerry Lee Lewis is a, a personal friend of mine. He's good because I taught him. <laughs> and the man, the man basically had said, uh, he scoffed and said, let me buy you a beer. So the two of them at the bar drank for a few hours, hung out for a few hours. And Daryl got to know the guy. And the guy ended up, probably because he had you know, a few beers, he said, I got I to gotta tell you, um, I'm a member of the KKK. 
a member of the Ku Klux Klan. I've never spoken, I've never talked to a black man before. And that's where that infamous Daryl said, I don't understand, you hate me, you've never even met me. So what ended up happening is these two, over their, their bond of Jerry Lee Lewis and piano, they became friends. And eventually this man went to his house, gave him his robe from the KKK, and said, you've taught me better, I'm done. After that day, Daryl Lewis became a bounty hunter of sorts, where he said, I'm going to find a way to invest in these people's lives, to show them that this hatred is wrong. I'm gonna get people out of the KKK. A black man hanging out at KKK rallies. I think the most infamous one was Roger Kelly. He was a grand high wizard within, the, like very high up in this horrible organization. Uh, and he, he called, he had a secretary call and say, hey, can I do an, I'm writing a book on the history of the KKK. Can Daryl was asking, can I interview you? Didn't say he was black. So he, he hid that. And when they got there, like guns drawn, it was very bad. He said like, we're good, calm down, calm down. Let's do the interview. So he said the interview was horrible and intense, but the interview happened again with Daryl and this high up leadership member of the KKK. And again, you, you know what God does, you know what happened. It went from, I'm gonna shoot you, to okay, let's talk again, to becoming friends, to this high wizard leader in the KKK, leaving the KKK, giving Daryl his robe, and asking Daryl to be his daughter's grandfather. You, yeah, yeah, crazy, right? That's what God does. To this day, Daryl has helped over 200 men get out of the Ku Klux Klan. 200 people going from hatred to repenting, all because, again, his love of Jesus and that, that just holy dissatisfaction of, like, I don't understand where this hatred comes from, and I got to do something about it. So why don't you stand with me? Because I got to tell you, when I was reading this story, it was moving, but there was something in my heart that was like, I just got like, at the time I was like, oh, no, Daryl, what are you doing, man? You know, like there was a bit in my sinful heart that was just like, these people are beyond saving, if I can be honest with you. Like, is there anything more vile in my mind than that? And again, not only Daryl, who's just a human being with the same spirit that we have, if we're gonna be Christians, he said, no, I think God could do something. And it was so moving to me that I just, I wanna end with us. Man, what if, what if we had even just a little ounce of that heart like Daryl has? Even people that have wronged us, that have hurt us, that have despised us, whatever, again, whatever, because we all have unique stories. Like, I, like we all have reasons why people have hurt us that we don't think they deserve God's mercy and grace. Is there anything more polarizing than this? And Daryl going, no, I know God can move. And he has over 200 times. What if we live like that? What if we forgave like that? What if we did not allow our own bitterness and unforgiveness and kind of spiritual bigotry, if you will, to get in the way of God's love? But going, if God is willing to help me and save me and heal me and restore me, again, fishermen and tax collectors, whatever it is, it's not, thank you, God, that I'm not like them. But no, God, I know you're gonna adopt them too. I know that your family is big. Your family is large. And my brothers and sisters in Christ look a whole lot different than me. And there's everyone in this kind of big family reunion in eternity all had sins and shortcomings and horrible things, but they were washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so was I. Man, what if we learned to live and to love like that? Let me pray over us. And then Christina's gonna dismiss us with a song. God, I, <laughs> I thank you that you made time for Zacchaeus person that was despised, hated in his town, had lived a life for such a long time. And then he encountered you and everything changed. God, I pray against the strongholds, the addictions, the things that we hold to is like, this is why I matter. This is why I'm important. This is why I'm either, you know, worse or better or deserving or undeserving, all the things, all our lists. God, would you destroy them? 
And may we embrace, just like Zacchaeus, fully welcomed you into his arms and into his home. May we welcome you, embrace you as our Lord and our Savior into our lives, into our souls, into every part of who we are. God, may we, may we never think or look at someone and think they're beyond saving. They don't deserve forgiveness. And would you deal with our bitterness and our unforgiveness in our own hearts? We thank you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>